we can relate to what Jesus says in today's gospel, albeit for different reasons. Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus said this as he stood at the temple, right after, as we politely say, he cleansed the temple. I'm standing in Solomon's colonnade. It was the first section that worshipers would enter at the temple in Jerusalem. Between the pillars were stalls of money changers. Your Roman money wasn't welcome at the Jewish temple, so you exchanged it here before you entered. You could also buy animals for sacrifice. A dove if you were poor, a lamb or goat if you could afford it. Unlike modern houses of worship that are quiet, clean, and serene, this part of the temple grounds was crowded and chaotic. And like most things that begin with good intent, a trip to the temple devolved into crass commercialism. With all the money changers and people selling animals, competing for business. That's why Jesus turned the tables on them and drove them out. This is a place of worship, not commerce. Jesus was consumed by zeal for God's house. We've been consumed by zeal for God's house as well, all year. The doors of this temple have been opened but it hasn't been safe to gather inside in large numbers, and that has consumed us. But in our case, it's not the temple that needs cleansing. It's the virus that's overturned our lives and forced us out. We want to worship. In fact, we need to worship. If we didn't know it before, we know it now. It's a lesson we learned in catechism. Roman Catholics may remember these words. God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. And Reformed Christians learned in the Westminster Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. And in the small catechism, Luther wrote, that keeping the Sabbath means that we do not despise God's word and the preaching of it, but acknowledge it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. Worship is as natural and necessary as breathing. And while we can worship God in any place at any time, we are most at home in our Father's house. We breathe easier here. Zeal for this house feeds our faith. But it can also consume us, and it may still if we're not careful. As we return to in-person services at church and to a more normal life in general, please do so gradually and carefully. It's not normal now, and we still need to exercise caution. When we resumed in-person services last October, we wrote 10 temporary commandments, simple rules we learned this year to live safely. At first, everyone followed them to the letter, but then week by week, we became less observant and more at risk. After three surges of COVID-19, we know what works and what doesn't. And as anxious as you might be to resume life as normal, don't let that zeal consume you. Obey the commandments. They are temporary. And graciously accept the constraints. The time will come when we can break out of our bubbles, take off the masks, shake hands and hug. But it's not time for that now. Let's be thankful for what we have. And let's live long enough to enjoy what's to come. So whether you're worshiping at home or here at this house of worship, welcome to worship. Welcome to Lord of life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Turn to me and be gracious.
The gospel for this Lord's Day is found in John, the second chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip out of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our risen Lord and Savior, in whose name we say, Amen. There's a lot going on in John's gospel in the reading we had for today. There's a lot going on in the entire chapter two of John's gospel, the fun first sign of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And then he goes down to Jerusalem and he commences making a mess of the temple. One of the interesting things in the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that also have the cleansing of the temple, It happens at the end of Jesus's life, the last week of his life, the only time in those gospels he goes to Jerusalem. John, however, has Jesus all over the place. He had a different story in mind, and he included this earlier in the gospel because it was part of the new beginnings of understanding who Jesus was and what he was about. The first was the wine into, the wine being made from the water in the miracle, and then this sign, changing around the concept of worship and temple. So we have a new beginning in John, and we have Jesus making this clear to us, in a way. And it was apparently clear to the disciples, but only after. Verse 22, after Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered what he had said. Then they believed the scripture. If the only thing you remember about this gospel reading for today is that verse, then I think we've gotten exactly what we need to get. Remember. After Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. The disciples are moving on with their lives. They're past these events. It's over. It's done. Jesus has been raised from the dead. They are remembering the most important message from this whole story. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy the temple. He's talking about his body. He will be made to suffer and die, and in three days rise again. And they remembered. They were remembering what Jesus said and how now it made sense after he, of course, had been raised. How many of you remember sayings from your parents, grandparents, I always thought my mom was making stuff up when she'd say things like, keep your own side of the street clean. What street? What stuff? Hmm. Or she'd say things like, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Well, after sharing this with some of my friends back in the day, I realized that their parents were saying it too. And I thought they must have all gone to the saying school for parents because they all had this whole litany of things they would just pull out of their hat when we would ask them questions or getting into trouble. And I remember them to this day. I remember especially, do as I say and not as I do. I'm pretty sure I use that one the most with my own children. So I remember things even though I don't remember where I learned them from. Things like when I'm walking down the street and someone approaches from the opposite direction, I move to the right. Where did we learn that? Was there a day in perhaps kindergarten where we learned most of the important things in life? Was there a day where we were taught that? Did we just learn from watching other people? Somehow I remember things and I don't even remember how I learned them. But the important thing is that we remember. 
If I were to ask you what you remember most from all of your Bible readings, from all of your whole life, what would come to mind? What do you remember most? What stories stand out? When you think about Jesus' stories, what stand out for you? What do you remember most? Perhaps Jesus' birth stories in Matthew or Luke, the angels, the shepherds, the magi, the escape into Egypt in Matthew's gospel. Well, we're in Lent, the season of Lent now. Perhaps you're remembering that this is the season where, that leads to the suffering and death of our Savior Jesus. Maybe those stories, like the one today, that reminds us that the end is near. Perhaps it's one of the parables, maybe the prodigal son or the lost coin. Or perhaps it's a conversation Jesus had that you remember most. In John's gospel, there are wonderful conversations. The woman at the well in John 4, or Nicodemus meeting Jesus at night in chapter 3, where we hear that verse that we've all learned and memorized, remember it well. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He says that when he's talking to Nicodemus. What we remember builds on our relationship with Jesus. It is important to remember, to remember the stories, remember the places, remember the people. What we remember becomes, in a way, our story too. Our reaction to what we remember makes that story ours. In Scripture, we are reminded how much God remembers. Genesis 9, after the flood, God puts the rainbow in the sky, the very first covenant he makes with his people. And he tells them, I will remember this everlasting covenant never to flood the entire earth again. God remembers. God tells us in the commandments, the third one, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He's asking us to remember. So many Psalms talk about how much God remembers. Psalm 111 verse 5. God will remember his covenant forever. There's so many places where we hear about God remembering. He remembers specific people, like Noah, the promise to Noah. God remembers Abraham and the covenant he made there. God remembers Rachel and opens her womb so that she might birth Benjamin and Joseph. God remembers. Jesus remembers as well. In John 15, verse 20, he says, Remember what I have told you. It's very important, he says. Remember what I have told you. Those poor disciples, if only they would have had a stenographer or somebody taking notes so that they could have remembered even more than we have in our scriptures today. Remember what I have told you. John 16, verse 4. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember. He's telling them they will. It'll be okay. You will remember. And then there are the most important words Jesus tells us, words at that Last Supper, words that he shares with his disciples at the celebration of the Passover, and he shares with us for all these centuries. For as often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, words that we say almost every week during our celebration of Holy Communion. We remember. We remember the person Jesus. We remember the acts of Jesus. We remember these words. Do this in remembrance of me. We are asked to remember. We need to remember. We need to remember the stories. Remember the people. Remember the names if they have them. The woman at the well is just the woman at the well. We need to remember what we were taught. We were to remember that these people lived, lived out the words of Christ. And we remember because in remembering, it does become real for us. In the retelling of these stories, they become our stories. We remember how important they are to our faith, to our Christian living. It's why we do what we do. It's why we come to worship. So we will remember. We will remember. So, With all that, what will you remember most about this gospel from this sermon? Well, how about most of all that God remembers us? He remembers his covenant made to us and for us. He remembers his son Jesus, 
to us, gives him to us, and we remember all that Christ has done for us. In remembrance of him, I say, Amen. Let us join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right ha hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our prayer response today to the prayers of the people is, Your mercy is great. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend vic victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. 
support, strengthen, and encourage the congregation of Pan de Vida Lutheran Church in El Mirage. Empower Pastor Mitch Eichmann and all later leaders in your church in that place. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves to our own interests. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witnesses reveal the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, 
shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in God's grace. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. <laughs>